This film documents the Vietnam War in the words of Americans who served there. It features home movies and rare archival footage collected during a worldwide search and now presented in high definition. Many scenes are graphic in nature and viewer discretion is advised. I know what it's about. What are Cuban doing? Don't I have a son that's going to go into the army? We fight because we must fight. If we're to live in a world where every country can shape its own destiny. Vietnam is not our war. We must say no. We will not be defeated. We today have concluded an agreement to end the war and bring peace with honor in Vietnam. Peace will come swiftly, but that is in the hands of others, and we must be prepared for a long, continued conflict. You know, they say the World War II guys were the best generation. Well, those who fought every war since then were the best of their generation. They went, they served, they sacrificed, and they fought like tigers. They were noble. school let out, all my teachers wanted to talk about was the battle between communism and democracy taking place in Vietnam. Most of us had barely heard of the place before. I may not know much about Vietnam, but communism is something else. Growing up during the Red Scares of the 50s, we've all heard about the horrible things that happened in communist countries, especially kids like me. I was, I was raised, raised a very strict, a very strict Catholic. Catholic. I was an altar boy at eight and 12 years of Catholic school. 
part of Catholic school was uh, reading anti-communist books. They would talk about how the communists would go into villages and chop the uh, tongues of uh, priests out so that they couldn't teach, teach the, the Our Father. So with that kind of stuff going on in Vietnam, I can see why they want to kick the communists out. I suppose it's a threat, all right. But at the same time, to be honest, it feels kind of far away. Even for me, it's hard to imagine how something on the other side of the world could really affect any of us in San Bernardino. America's involvement in Vietnam began in 1954, when a political treaty divides the country in two. Communist China and the Soviet Union support the North, while the United States backs the South. Fearing the spread of communism throughout the region, Presidents Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson provide South Vietnam with military and financial assistance. By the spring of 1964, Vietnam is becoming a hotspot in the Cold War. More than 16,000 U.S. advisors are training South Vietnam's army to battle a homegrown guerrilla force known as the Viet Cong, or VC. With the support of the North, the VC are working to overthrow the South Vietnamese government and reunite the country under communist rule. But what has been primarily a civil war is about to change. The first time I came out here, it was almost hard to believe that such a pristine landscape could really be hiding tens of thousands of enemy infiltrators. Only my South Vietnamese counterparts were quick to remind me of the truth. They've been fighting and dying in these jungles for almost 10 years, struggling to stop the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong from taking over their country. 24-year-old Lieutenant Bob Cluel is serving as a military advisor to the Arvin, South Vietnam's army. Our orders are to accompany the Arvin units we're assigned to on field operations. Our primary uh, purpose for being there was not to engage the enemy. Our primary purpose for being there was to advise the friendly uh, nation or force and let them engage the enemy. That's how it kind of got started. <laughs> By the fall of 1964, the South Vietnamese government is in political disarray. While its military is crumbling under the advances of nearly 150,000 Viet Cong soldiers, who control nearly half of the South Vietnamese countryside. Supplied with weapons and reinforcements from the north, the Viet Cong are farmers by day and fighters by night, capable of launching hit and run attacks and then melting back into the jungle, undetected. Both the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese view the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution as a declaration of war by the Americans. And they intend to fight. In the pre-dawn hours of November 1st, 1964, the Viet Cong launch a surprise attack on one of the four U.S. air bases in South Vietnam. 
It is their first direct assault against U.S. personnel inside the country. Four Americans are killed. We had advisors and military assets in South Vietnam for years. The Viet Cong had never intentionally tried to destroy them. 23-year-old Joe Galloway is a correspondent for United Press International. For years, he's been closely following America's growing involvement in Vietnam. We were getting more deeply involved in that situation and that it was going to become America's war, my generation's war. And I had always said to myself that if a war came along during my time, I wanted to cover it. I started driving my bosses absolutely crazy, demanding, begging, pleading for a transfer to get in position for the war I was sure was coming. An alive horse of more than 8,000 men today... On February 7th, 1965, Viet Cong forces strike a second U.S. air base. Eight Americans are killed and another 126 wounded. Weeks after the play coup attack, President Johnson authorizes a large-scale bombing campaign inside North Vietnam. Codenamed Operation Rolling Thunder, the strategy is twofold. Cripple the North Vietnamese war effort by destroying military and industrial targets and crush their will to fight by demonstrating the awesome extent of American power. U.S. command believes both objectives can be accomplished in just eight weeks. This operation may be only scheduled the last eight weeks, but I intend to get in as much flight time as I can before it's over. 31-year-old Captain Keith Connolly is flying an F-100 Super Sabre with the 416th Tactical Fighter Squadron as part of Operation Rolling Thunder. I had never been to war. In fact, I didn't understand what war was all about. So obviously we were very, very apprehensive about this, but everybody thought in the back of their mind that the war was going to be over. It wouldn't take long for us to show up with our awesome firepower and do the things that we had demonstrated out in our training ranges that would bring the enemy to his knees. They weren't going to be able to sustain themselves uh, with this awesome capability of the American forces. But the start of rolling thunder has brought an unexpected problem. The American pilots and planes stationed inside South Vietnam are vulnerable to Viet Cong attack. So to protect them, U.S. commanders want ground troops sent to Vietnam for the first time. They ask President Johnson to approve. Johnson knows that the ground troops will be seen by the American public, as well as North Vietnam, as a step towards a larger war. Every night before I turn out the lights to sleep, I ask myself this question. Have I done everything I can to help unite the world? To try to bring peace and hope to all the peoples of the world? Have I done enough? On March 8, 1965, at 8.15 a.m., 3,500 Marines with the 9th Expeditionary Brigade land in South Vietnam. For the first time since the Korean War, battle-ready American ground troops are setting foot on the Asian mainland. Yeah. 
Half of these guys never even heard of Vietnam before they got here. Now they're getting one heck of a tour. United Press International correspondent Joe Galloway is with a platoon of 40 Marines patrolling outside the U.S. airbase at Da Nang. Their orders are strictly defensive. I nagged the hell out of my bosses to get here and cover this conflict, but now that I'm here, the VC don't really seem like that much of a threat. I don't think any one of these Marines has even seen a communist yet. I know I sure as hell have. But then again, the VC are guerrilla fighters. They know how to hide in plain sight. Back at base, guys are hanging out in each other's hooches, screwing around and listening to music. Feels more like a college dorm room than barracks in a war zone. You know you make me wanna show, kick my heels up and show, throw my hands up and show, throw my head back and show, come on now, don't forget to say you will, don't forget to say yeah, 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 say you will, say it right now, baby, say you will, come on, baby, come on. A lot of guys keep coming up to me, wanting to tell me their names and hometown, so... Hopefully I'll mention them in an article and the folks back in the States will see it. I think it's kind of cool. Sort of makes me feel like Ernie Pyle. He won a Pulitzer for reporting on the Grunt's Eye View in World War II. I'd read Ernie Pyle's columns and I thought, if you're gonna, I'm gonna cover, cover a war. war. That's the way to do it. I was very impressed with how he covered his generation's war. And, uh... I wanted to do it the same way, covering the soldiers as far forward as you can get. These guys all fully expect to get the job done and be home in a couple of months. Although for my sake, I kind of hope it doesn't end too quickly before I get a chance to write about some real action. left for this assignment. Told my wife I'd be home before the summer's over. I figured there was no way a little third world country would even come close to competing with our firepower. Now I'm starting to see how wrong I was. Captain Keith Connolly and his fellow pilots are three weeks into Operation Rolling Thunder. The eight-week-long air campaign intended to bomb North Vietnam into submission. So far, the results are falling short of expectations. seem to matter how much destruction we inflict. The North Vietnamese rebuild everything. And then we get sent back up here to hit it again. There's a frustration level on behalf of On behalf of the pilots. Sometimes we'd be going back to the same areas, hitting the same targets repeatedly, and not understanding why we were being targeted into the same areas over and over. And it dawned upon us that this war was not going to be over in a short few months. 
And a live force of more than 8,000 men today tightened his hold on the baton gun. On March 30th, 1965, the Viet Cong explode a car bomb in front of the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. 22 people are killed, and 183 more are injured. Over the next three months, VC forces continue to attack U.S. and South Vietnamese installations throughout the country, while the South Vietnamese Army proves powerless to stop them. With South Vietnam nearing collapse, the head of U.S. operations in Vietnam, General William Westmoreland, makes a momentous request. He asks President Johnson for permission to take the offensive and for the first time use U.S. ground troops to seek out the enemy and drive them out of the South. On July 28, 1965, in a press conference televised to the nation, Johnson announces his decision. I have asked the commanding general, General Westmoreland, what more he needs to meet this mounting aggression. He has told me, and we will meet his needs. I have today ordered to Vietnam the Air Mobile Division and certain other forces which will raise our fighting strength from 75,000 to 125,000 men almost immediately. Additional forces will be needed later and they will be sent as requested. This will make it necessary to increase our active fighting forces by raising the monthly draft call from 17,000 over a period of time to 35,000 per month. soldiers have descended upon South Vietnam. 250,000 North Vietnamese and Viet Cong are poised to meet them. The newly arriving Americans are about to get more than they bargained for. the excitement building. We finally got intelligence that 200 NVA soldiers are in the hills of the Chupong Mountain. UPI reporter Joe Galloway has joined up with the 1st Cavalry, one of the Army's new air mobile assault units. After months of fighting small, frustrating skirmishes, U.S. forces are preparing to launch their first major assault against 200 North Vietnamese soldiers using an experimental new tactic, air mobility. Equipped with UH-1 Hueys, the 1st Cavalry is designed to insert soldiers into combat using helicopters. For this encounter, they will make their first attempt at inserting a force of 450 Americans to fight the 200 NVA. But as the men prepare for battle, a potentially serious problem weighs on the mind of the commanding officer, Colonel Hal Moore. The spot where they will land, a small clearing designated Landing Zone X-Ray, was chosen because of its close proximity to the enemy. It is too small, however, to land more than eight helicopters at a time. With each chopper able to carry only about six men, it will take several hours to get all 450 soldiers on the ground. 
any commander's fear in a case like that. If you land and you've only got a few of your troops, less than a hundred, and the enemy comes on you, you're in a bind. If you go down, the LZ is closed, the landing zone is closed, and whoever's in there dies. At 10.19 a.m., Firebase Falcon, five miles from the landing zone, lets loose a vicious barrage of artillery into the enemy positions. The 28-minute onslaught is meant to clear the LZ so the helicopters can land safely. At 10.35 a.m., the first U.S. choppers lift off and begin the 13-minute flight to the landing zone. Four miles outside of LZ X-ray, the choppers drop to treetop level. In front of them lays a landscape of smoke and exploding U.S. ordnance. The barrage is intricately timed to stop just one minute before the soldiers hit the ground. If the timing is off by even a few seconds, they will risk being hit with their own artillery. I was staying close to the tent where the radios were. Radios were at brigade headquarters so that I could hear if anything started happening. Bravo Company is sweeping the area around the LZ. So far, all is quiet. Already the choppers are delivering the second load of soldiers. Everything seems to be going according to plan until 11.15 a.m. Bravo's first platoon captures a single unarmed NVA soldier. He's immediately taken to the command center for interrogation. At 11.20, the prisoner makes an incredible revelation. He tells the interpreter there are three full battalions of North Vietnamese soldiers on the mountain, and that all of them want very much to kill Americans. It's unbelievable. Three battalions, that's almost 1,600 soldiers. No one can believe what they're hearing. We've got less than 200 men on the ground, meaning we're outnumbered eight to one. Roger, see you again. Within minutes, U.S. and North Vietnamese forces are locked in vicious combat. While the men on the ground desperately attempt to keep the North Vietnamese from overrunning the LZ, the pilots of the 1st Cavalry continue to ferry in the remainder of the 450 men amid a vicious torrent of enemy bullets and rockets. There are things about battle that movies cannot teach you, and that is the true, horrendous noise of battle. Bullets cracking, uh, bombs landing, artillery shells exploding, people screaming. Uh, it's just a cacophony that's almost deafening. After nearly eight hours of battle, casualties are mounting and supplies are running low. But with night fast approaching, all further landings must be called off until dawn. The 450 battered Americans 
are on their own and will have to survive the night in the face of an overwhelming enemy. Last night, the enemy launched several small attacks against our lines. The dead still lay where they were killed. It's too dangerous to try and move them. Joe Galloway is the only correspondent at Landing Zone X-Ray. Of the 450 soldiers on the battlefield, 85 are already dead or wounded. Those still alive are desperately in need of ammunition and supplies. Word is that reinforcements are going to try and land a few miles away and try to fight their way over to us. God, I hope they make it. At the base of the Chupong Mountain are nearly 1,600 enemy soldiers. A few hundred yards in front of them stands only a thin line of Americans, pounded and exhausted from nearly 24 hours of constant fighting. The enemy's sporadic attacks during the night were to determine the most vulnerable points in the U.S. lines. Now they know the best way to breach them, and they are preparing to put this knowledge to use. AM. 200 NBA soldiers hit C Company's first and second platoons. Company commander Bob Edwards is shot through the shoulder, leading his men in a counterattack. His XO, Lieutenant Arrington, runs up to assist, but within minutes he is also shot right through the chest. The enemy is within 75 yards of their lines. Some of the men are down to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat. Yeah, 7.15, NBA soldiers hit Delta Company, right where they connect with Charlie Company. The line is starting to break down. Enemy's bullets are passing was right passing through the Passing right center. through the command area where we were sitting. And I just fell over on my belly and got as flat as I could. And finally, Colonel Moore looked at the Air Force liaison lieutenant, Charlie Hastings. Moore looks at him and says, call Broken Arrow. Broken Arrow was a code at that time, meant that an American unit was in dire danger of being overrun and wiped out. And when that call was given, every available fighter bomber in Vietnam diverted to that place to deliver their bombs. about then that I heard Colonel Moore yelling, get him off of us, Charlie. Get him off of us. Call that SOB off. And I looked up, and there are two F-100 Super Sabre jets like this 
They're coming directly at us. The lead plane has already punched the pickle switch and will turn loose canisters of napalm. Hal was trying to stop the second guy from dumping his on us. But unfortunately, for two or three engineer demolition guys, they were right in the path. And in that flame, I could see these two men dancing and screaming. And someone yelled, get this man's feet. And I reached down and picked him up and uh, his boots crumbled. The flesh on his ankles just peeled off. I could feel the ankle bone in the palm of my hands. Uh, and we carried him over to where the wounded were. It was a young specialist uh, named Jim Nakayama out of uh, Rigby, Idaho. Married. Wife had a baby that week. He died two days later. That boy is my nightmare. moments of this battle. UPI reporter Joe Galloway is surveying the aftermath at Landing Zone X-ray in the Yadrang Valley. A young specialist named Arthur Vieira is bleeding from wounds all over his body. The most serious is a bullet hole right through his throat. The battalion surgeon, Captain Carrera, performs an emergency tracheotomy. A few yards away is Clinton Poley farm boy from Iowa. He took grenade, shrapnel, and gunshot wounds, but never left his post at one of the M60s that kept the second platoon alive. These are some of the bravest, most dedicated soldiers I have ever seen. Despite the friendly fire incident, the close-in bombing support from U.S. aircraft succeeded in pushing the enemy back and allowed the Americans to regain the offensive.
America's first major battle with the North Vietnamese has ended in victory. One soldier pulls a small American flag from his pack and hangs it on a shattered, blown up tree stump. He looks at his buddies and grins. Just like Iwo Jima, he says. Another battle won for the United States. You're damn right. These men have accomplished something extraordinary. Just like their fathers on the beaches of Tarawa or Normandy, they fought an incredible battle against incredible odds and came out on top. Now I've seen for myself what war is really about. It's about how a farm boy from Iowa hangs onto a machine gun for eight hours so he can protect his injured buddies, even when he himself is wounded and bleeding. Or how an African-American boy from Charlotte and a white boy from Houston decide they'd rather die together than abandon the other in the midst of battle. War is about men who love their country. But even more than that, love one another. I left that landing zone x-ray. Battlefield, knowing that young Americans had laid down their lives so that I might live. They had sacrificed themselves for me and their buddies. What I was learning was that there are some events that are so overwhelming that you can't simply be a witness. You can't be above it. You can't be neutral. You can't be untouched by it. Simple as that. You see it. You live it. You experience it, and it will be with you all of your days. Over the following two days, additional battles will be fought in the Yadrang Valley, engaging even more NVA soldiers. By the time the fighting ends, a total of 234 Americans lay dead. With enemy deaths estimated at nearly 3,000, U.S. commanders come up with a new strategy. The lopsided 12 to 1 kill ratio convinces them that in this war without a front, body count will be the measure of success. And the helicopter, which has proven capable of operating in the midst of intense battle, will be an important weapon in executing this strategy. U.S. commanders now believe they have found the blueprint for total victory in Vietnam. <laughs> 